welcome to a tribute to Agnes Baker Pilgrim. And this is a special episode of Adventures in Education. I'm your host, John Letts. And this is part two of this tribute. If you want to see part one, probably the best way is to go to the archive site, archive.org, and you'll get to see part one. And of course, if you want to see this part again, part two, that'll also be at the archive site. Uh, I have two guests here that are going to help in this tribute. I have Tish McFadden and I have Thomas Doty, storyteller. And uh, I just want to do a, a quick um, kind of check-in and let, uh, excuse me, I am going to cough. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so in part one we saw a lot of, of Grandma Aggie's activities that people uh, got to know in the valley, mm -hmm. uh, the Rogue Valley. And by the way, the Rogue River is sacred. Yes. And so is the water in the river. And according to Grandma Aggie, all the water is sacred. Now, I think it's wonderful the way that she always blesses her water. Yeah. And so instead of coughing again, I'm going to <laughs> thank this water for settling my throat. And you know it's kind of it, it's it's kind of funny because having heard her say so much about being thankful for the water, mm -hmm. we were talking before the program. That thankful heart gets transferred to other things. Yes. So yes, mm -hmm. the water is absolutely we can't live without it. Mm -hmm. But you know maybe you thank your car for bringing you someplace, you know, or you know you thank your pet for giving you comfort. You know, the, yeah. it's. There's so much, and, and she definitely had that, that thankful heart, I think, that anyone could see who a, was a in her. A spirit book. of gratitude. Spirit of gratitude. For everything. And, and you came up, Tish, with 25 of her teachings. Yes. And um, uh, gratefulness or thankfulness was one of them. Definitely. And a little bit later, uh, Grandma Aggie herself is going to talk about the sacred salmon ceremony. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole part of that with reciprocity, which was another The giving major, back, yes. The giving back. But for now, we're going to look at uh, Grandma Aggie working with some second graders in Grants Pass at Lincoln <laughs> School. And it's just a wonderful thing of her showing some of the art mm -hmm. that was done by uh, her Native people. So let's look at Aggie art now. So you have to wait till the little shoots come up before the limbs come out, and you pick them before the little limbs come out to do the finer work. Also in this is the um, bear grass, which is on top of the mountains. It too has to be burned. And they used to tell me, the old ones way back, that you have to pick it before July the 15th. You can weave it and in your work, but when it dries, it'll kind of kind of pucker up. So they pick it after July the 15th. And, it, and you pick it, it's green, so you have to leave it out until it gets real light like it's in these things here. And that's the bear grass and it's held together with spruce roots. Um, in this cap, the black is the five-fingered ferns that you see along creeks and streams. They call it the maidenhair fern or the five-fingered fern, and that's the black in this cap. The red in my cap here is the bear grass that is dyed, the white, this whitey light stuff in here is bear grass, and it's dyed with the inside bark of the alder tree to make it red. I love seeing some of the work that Grandma Aggie did with the children. I know that, that passing down to the next generation was something very important to her. Oh yes, she, she, she really wanted her teachings to be rippled out to our next generations. And the audiobook that she did record back in 2015 is a wonderful collection of her stories, but the book isn't something that children would read necessarily. And so the Up River to Morning Project is a way to have taken some of those teachings from her and put them into a story that's accessible to all ages. And you had Grandma Aggie's blessing on this project. Oh, yes, as she would say from the get-go, mm. she was 100% behind it. Well, she first trusted 
me, uh, I think just innately. And I know she's known Thomas for years and years. And so also Julie Norman, who's very involved. And I think just she had the sense that this was doing something to help her culture, to help keep her teachings going forward into the long future. And she, she trusted, she trusted it, which I'm very, very grateful for. And, and now that, uh, speaking of generations, yeah. her family has given you that blessing as well. Yes, I wanted to make sure that her daughters her, were aware that this project was still going to continue and to get their blessing and support as well, which I have received. Yeah, it's been really nice getting to know Nadine, especially her daughter who lives in Grants Pass. Nadine came out to all the film shoots. She's been at all the special events that we've attended. And uh, she's, she's a huge supporter of this and project. And Tom, you're part of this project as well. Yeah, I came on pretty early on in the project, I guess, also from the get-go. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. And as a cultural consultant uh, for the Tacoma material that's interwoven within the story and also eventually to, to do some other work with the project as well, to record the audio book, to to write a story theater script and some other supporting educational materials. And I know for you, being accurate is very important. It's something that it you care a lot about. It's extremely important. You know, the, the unfortunate thing that we've had for the past several years in this area is that the most easily accessible materials available to teachers on Native people have often been the least accurate ones and teachers don't have time to dig through hundreds of pages of handwritten field notes from the 1930s to find just that right little thing to share with their fourth grade students the next day. And so having Upriver to Morning fill that void, have something incredibly accurate with all the educational materials there that the teachers can use, and the trust that this is really Tacoma culture accurately portrayed, I think that's really, really important. I also love the way that you share a lot of this material, and you've had years of going mm -hmm. through this, and, and you share that on your website. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big website. <laughs> <laughs> There's 1,500 pages of stuff. There are a lot of free resources on Native cultures, and you know, I was blessed to have wonderful teachers and resources available to me as I started into storytelling, continue through storytelling. So this is my way of giving back, giving back some of those sources I used and, mm. and having those available. And I kind of picture the next generation of storytellers stepping up and, and taking what I've had to offer as well as what I learned from into the next generation of, of storytelling in Tacoma culture. And I would say to anyone wanting to go to that website, don't let the 1,500 pages <laughs> turn you off because it's very user friendly. Yeah. And, and I very always, well organized. Yeah, I find it? little treasures yeah. there all the time. Well, speaking of treasures, <clears throat> uh, Grandma Aggie had a lot of importance on music. And in the next video clip, we find out at least partly why that became so important to her. So let's watch this video clip of Aggie and music. My father was a musician, and all through Lincoln County, Oregon, where I grew up, there were signs all over the stores and businesses, dogs and Indians aren't allowed. And so my dad was smart. I didn't realize how smart until I grew up, because he made us all to pick an instrument to play, because he could play all kinds of instruments. And so we got together, all of us, my brothers and sisters, and so we had a band when we were young, and we used to play for dances. And as I grew up, I found out my dad was right, because music is a wonderful gift that you could give yourself, that it made you fit and belong. It's what had happened to my brothers and sisters. We fit and we belong. And so it was a good thing, because my dad, I think, was a farseer that he could see that it would help us. And it sure did, he was right. And so I used to play it, oh, I used to play violin, piano, plectrum, banjo, <coughs> ukulele, and all of these instruments. And I used to, when I was young, sing all over Oregon. And when KWJJ in Portland of uh, 
act didn't show up, they'd call me to come and fill in. You're watching a tribute to Grandma Aggie, and you just heard her talk about the importance of music. And one of my guests is very involved with music, mm -hmm. and that's Tish McFadden. <laughs> Tish, yeah. you even teach music. Yeah, and it's an accidental profession. It, I, I started teaching music after my anthropology and archaeology career here in Southern Oregon. But I wanted to mention the parallel with Agnes. She said it was her father who got her into music, and she learned many instruments and sang all across the country. And just I want to honor my dad, who was the, my inspiration for music since when I was uh, old enough to sit on his lap at a piano mm. and my feet swinging in midair. But music's been a big part of my life, and I've taught music for 31 years in Ashland at the Rum Tum School of Music. And the point, just to echo Aggie's love for music and knowing its importance, like she says, it, it opens doors, it helps you connect with people, is I've, I've taught ages 4 to 94, mm. all through every, every generation, decade, and I witness it every day, the joy music brings and the connections it brings. So this piece from Aggie is a place I feel personally very connected to her. Wow, and, and she, that was part of, the, that interview was part of, uh, of, Up to Morning, of yeah. your Up River to Morning. Yes, it was. Now, uh, Tom, I, I learned from you that in the storytelling of the Tequilma people, the first words out of someone's mouth in telling a story are? Willy Yowo, which means there was a house. There was a house. Well, there was a house <laughs> in our lifetime, too. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's, let's see this. This is Grandma Aggie talking about the traditional type of house that was built by and lived in by the people who live here. Hello, my name is Tawaiwi, and my English name is Agnes Baker Pilgrim. Because I sit here in front of this pit house that I think is the only one in Oregon that through a grant that we received in 1999, we were able to build this little pit house here by the Kirbyville Museum. Some people donated some logs and there were a lot of knots in it, so they weren't able to split them by hand. So we had to bring into uh, over here a little portable mill to slab the slumber, which blew the authenticity. But still, it's a wonderful little replica of what my people lived in hundreds and hundreds of years ago. To sit here now and to speak and be their voice of the ancient ones is quite a pleasure for me. This little house that has a pit inside. Build your fire down in the middle and of course towards the top with a smoke hole. And that where you could make a bed around the edges and sleep there. So they could put little shelves in there too for their clothing or for their food. This uh, picture here is of a dragonfly. And my people believed that they were the transformer, which meant that when they died and went to the star nation, that they came back as dragonflies. Uh, even when I was fishing, they come and sit on my fish pole and I talk to them. And, and, and just like they were human beings, but they've been a phenomenal thing in my life. And so uh, maybe they touched your heart too. So Thomas Doty, she, she ended with this whole thing with the dragonfly. Mm -hmm. That's an extremely important part of being Tacoma. It is. The, uh, the dragonfly brothers, who we call the Doll Doll brothers, are both tricksters and transformers. They, in the Tacoma culture, the traditional mythology, they travel up the Rogue River to prepare the, the landscape, the, the Tacoma world, for the arrival of the people. And uh, the Dal Dal brothers also make an appearance in, in Tish's story, Up River to Morning. And they have a lot to do with, uh, you know, opposing uh, viewpoints. You know, Elder Dragonfly is very, very wise. He's the elder brother. Younger Dragonfly is always getting into trouble and having to call for his elder brother for for help, and so they're kind of bickering back and forth a whole lot. But it's a kind of thing that, that brings a kind of a balance and a double perspective. And of course, the two parts of a trickster character are the, you know, the, the fool, the guy who breaks the rules, the, but also the, the wise person. And so they're portraying those two parts of a, tra a classic trickster character. 
I'm glad she had we, we had a chance to have her introduce that whole concept. Which, by the way, Aggie was very good at doing as well. <laughs> she was a wonderful, wonderful elder, uh, the grandmother to everybody, but she had her little bag of tricks as well. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said you don't want to get in, in between her wheelchair and where she was going. And, and especially if she had her cane. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, when someone knows what they're doing, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. um, well, let's hear. One, one of the things that, that, that Grandma Aggie knew what she was doing was restoring the sacred salmon ceremony. And this mm -hmm. is a, a wonderful little video clip of her explaining mm. that whole process. So let's watch uh, Aggie Sacred Salmon, too. I would like to talk to you about the salmon ceremony that uh, started at that powerhouse dam about a mile up to Gold Hill from Gold Hill, Oregon, on the Rogue River on the South Bank. Thousands of our native people of all bands came right here to do what we're doing here this weekend. And so this is the first on the Rogue River in over 151 years to bring this culture and the old paradigm back to the people. And I feel very honored in the presence of the unseen, my ancient people. I know the old people said, when you call them, they come. So the unseen walks among, amongst us here today. And I feel honored to be able to follow in their footsteps, teaching reciprocity, how to give back, this is why our divers are out there in the sweat lodge, doing a purification sweat. That when they come over here, by then, we'll have a taste of the salmon, and you bring all the skin and bones back to me. When the divers come with cedar boughs on their hands, which are, are sacred to us also, that they will then eat some of the fish, and the bones and skin are placed like that on their hands. The drum starts and drums them to the river. They too pray to the salmon people, who the old ones said they looked like us, but they lived in beautiful cities below the ocean floor. That they took on the shape of the salmon, the flesh of the salmon, every spring and every fall, to come back up this river to feed us. This is why I teach reciprocity, how to give back those bones and skins that the divers try to place at the bottom of the water and praying to the salmon that they're sacred and allow these skin and bones to go back into salmon again so that they can come back to feed us every year. We did this for 13 years on the Applegate. The second year, here come the state fishing game, said, we don't know what you've done, but there's more salmon than we ever heard of in the Applegate River. I didn't do anything, Creator did. We do these things in a good way, then the Creator blesses us in that manner. We certainly see a lot of Grandma Aggie's uh, spirit <laughs> in that video clip. And uh, Tom, I know you've been involved with, with these uh, uh, sacred salmon ceremonies uh, back when they were happening at the Applegate River mm -hmm. and now in the, uh, uh, the location that's uh, very special to them. Well, after several years out on the Applegate, and we did the ceremony there because the original site at Telemeek Falls on the Rogue River was not available to us. And the Forest Service offered this piece of land, so we did it out there. Well, in around 2006, Stephen Kiesling bought the property at Telemeek, and he had a connection to this property. He, he knew it was important. He didn't quite know at first why. And somebody said, oh, you should talk to, to Tom Doty. And so I, I talked to him about the salmon ceremony that happened there, and I introduced him to Grandma. Aggie and the three of us planned to bring the ceremony back to its original site at Tillamook. And so one uh, December twilight in 2006, on a very rainy night, the three of us stood on the overlook looking over Tillamook Falls at the story chair where Aggie's father had sat back in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And Aggie did this wonderful blessing of uh, bringing the salmon people back and the ceremony while we held an umbrella over her head it was <laughs> but um, it seemed very appropriate because we were talking also about water so not only was the river there but the heavens were pouring forth lots of water as well that's great what an unforgettable yeah. moment yeah and with us mm. well let's uh grandma aggie this year um in 2019 in august received the highest award mm -hmm. from the university here called the president's medal Let's uh, see uh, 
some video about that ceremony. Many hours that she sat by herself in preparing the materials because that's her way. Things that she has done that no one has knowledge of. The time that she's taken with people requiring no recognition, but only from the true giving of her heart and her spirit. We thank you for her example. We thank you for her leadership. We thank you for her kindnesses that she's exhibited to many people in time out of mind. This year's recipient, Grandma Aggie, will join these individuals and be forever recognized for the impact she has had on our larger world. Grandma Aggie, it is my honor this year to present this award to you. She's the founder of the Conaway Nika Tilikum Native American Youth Academy. This eight-day residential program for Native American middle and high school students has changed many lives. And we are so proud that we continue to host that program here. Returning to SOU in midlife and then graduating at age 61 and going on to contribute to Southern Oregon University, to the Native American community, and to the world. And I pray even when I go home that it will profit our Native kids. I care about all life. You know, and I live in Vance Pass. I could go up and live with my tribal people, but I've lived down there because a little mile north of where I live, all my ancient ones were born there in Jim Off Joe area. And so I feel like they've been helping me and guiding me all these many years. Agnes Baker Pilgrim, a beloved community member and a grandmother to all, passed away in late November at the age of 95. A celebration of her life and legacy was held at the Josephine County Expo Saturday. She said her work here is done, grandfather. But you see everyone here. She was the oldest living member of the Tekelma people and a strong advocate for the environment and Native American culture. The room for Grandma Aggie's celebration was packed to the brim with people who say that she was one of a kind. I think her tough as nails and yet sacred spiritual nature, the combination was such an incredible paradox. She was a magic person in this life, I feel like she, she reached out to so many and her heart was just so pure. Prayers and stories were shared, tables set up with art and pictures, all showcasing Grandma Aggie's incredible life and accomplishments. It's a remarkable life. That's a lot of years yeah. put together in, in service. Very joyful. I just, I just see her dancing right now. I can just feel her. Celebrating her legacy brought out many emotions for those around. To sit here and to be here and recognize it and just to see it all laid before us is just such a beautiful thing. In Grants Pass, Mariah Mills, NBC5 News. So that was the uh, celebration of life in Grants Pass. And uh, Thomas, you had a poem that you contributed to that event. I did, I did. Uh, it's a poem called Grandmother. And it's a poem I wrote about Grandma Aggie and water and all of those wonderful things that she likes. It goes like this. You grandmother, you creek, foaming away and away down the hills 
to the sea. I want to slant a tree across your flowing, slow you down, make a pond, dive deep and deeper under the froth, till the spring flooding the current all yellow with pollen shakes loose the log dam, takes you and me away and away where the sea and the sky foam together. Wow. You mm. know, and beautiful. that's a beautiful poem and a great, a, a great uh, way of, of <sighs> making the circle come back. Yes. Just like the, the water that you're talking about. Yes. The, the complete circle. I want to thank both of you so much for helping with this tribute and a privilege. Thank you, indeed. And I have a lot of people to acknowledge and, and, and uh, thank. Julie Norman uh, was involved with that clip on the art. Of course, Upriver to Morning, we've used mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of things, that, uh, video that's involved with that. That one about the house was a mystic corridor presentation. Uh, Sacred Salmon, uh, Ralph Bowman was the producer of that video clip. Um, of course, uh, for the SOU uh, event, uh, Pete Bedell, Brian Horton of KOBI, uh, I want to thank them for letting us use that. And then, um, of course, I want to thank my crew. You guys have done a wonderful job of putting this together. Doing credit to yeah. this type of program of, uh, I, wanted, I, I definitely wanted a good, respectful tribute, and I'm glad that we got that. And so thank you, crew. Thank you for watching. Uh, and I will just say that um, if you want to watch this and, and part one, uh, just go to archive.org, and it will be posted on there fairly soon. So thanks again for watching. I'm John Letts. Yeah.